while Jack is adjusting. And I'm a little echoey still, right? Just a little. But that's okay. He'll get it adjusted as we go along. Welcome, everyone, to Wednesday Night Church at Bethel Christian. We appreciate everyone who's tuning in tonight and really appreciate those who are here. Those who are here are wondering why there's only a center section. It's because we have open house tomorrow night. And our school has outgrown every room in this facility except this one. So instead of having a sit down explanation kind of a thing tomorrow night, they're gonna have tables like a college fair all set up. We'll have tables for dance and some for sports and some for other things, um, performing arts and they can look at our curriculum. Yes, we let parents look at our curriculum ahead of time. So that's what we're doing tomorrow night. We're expecting a really good turnout we already have a family pestering us to enroll their kindergartner for next year. And we haven't en opened our enrollment yet, but they have a student that already went through kindergarten. I think the student's in first grade now, and they want to make absolutely certain that the next one gets to get in here because they are so thrilled with our school. And that, that just blesses me. Praise God. Let's open with prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your love and for your care and that you love us so much you choose to share yourself with us, that your spirit lives in us. Holy Spirit, have your way tonight as we discuss this topic. Help us all to self-examine if there are things that we need to take care of, if there are things that we need to work to forgive about. We thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us. We are, all, we are already forgiven, regardless of what we do or say or think. But may all of that please you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the topic of my series has been how not to be miserable. But we are not only talking about how not to be miserable, we're talking about how to be miserable so that if you know how to be miserable, you may be able better to know how not to be miserable. And if Pastor Mike comes wandering in here a little bit later, the wind kept shutting our power off all day. He said in a two-hour span, it went off on and off 15 times. And he's been trying to print out the school calendar to give out tomorrow night at the open house. And every time he went to do it, either the power would go off or the machine would get jammed, and he had to have Kevin, our, our bookkeeper, get out there and fiddle with the machine, and ah, you know how things are. First world problems, that's the truth, isn't it? So he's making those copies now so that tomorrow, when all the teachers need photocopies for lessons or kids or whatever, he's not taking up the copier. So that's what he's doing, and he may wander in, or he may be in there, working his hardest not to cuss at the machine. So I don't know exactly what he's doing. We have been, we were talking last week about blaming, about how blaming, if you want to be miserable, hang on to blame. Is this working? There we go. So what we talked about last week, how holding on to blame, not letting it go. Holding a grudge is a really good way to put it. Somebody hurt you, or you did something stupid, or you don't think God was fair to you, and you hang on to that resentment. You don't do anything to get rid of it. Tonight, we're going to talk about the opposite of blame. Excuse or excuse. And you may think, well, that's what we're supposed to do. No, excusing and forgiving are not the same thing. Excuse or excuse means to remove blame. It means to consider as non-offensive or to consider justified. I changed it and I forgot to change it on that slide. Or to deny the harm. I have a hard time when I talk about things like this because this all points out to a particular family member in my life 
that I had to get past this. If you were raised in a Christian home, it's highly likely that offenses were committed against you or against other people in your home, but it was excused. Oh, well, that's just the way they are. Oh, did, did I hit a nerve there? Or, oh, they don't mean anything by it. Anybody hear, hear those things? Anybody say those things? Well, we're going to talk about what causes resentment is when we excuse instead of forgive. Now, this is how we excuse other people, like I just said. We remove the blame for other people. They didn't really mean it that way. It's someone or something else's fault. Could be the way they were raised. Could be because their dad was mean to them. Could be because they are a little slow. Or could be, you know what I'm saying? Every reason in the world why it's not their fault. Or it could be justifying. Well, you must have asked for it. Ever have an elder, an older family member or friend who was just vicious to you? And when you went and told your parents, they said, well, you must have asked for it. There are people that carry that into their adult life. And when people are just brutal to them, oh, well, I must have done something. I must have said something. Now, we'll be talking about that attitude a little bit later on. But you know that everything in moderation is what we're supposed to be doing. We also understand that everything that is right is corrupted by the enemy. Everything that is good is warped by the enemy. And it's difficult a lot of times to be able to tell the real from the counterfeit. Just like in my ring, some of these I think are, I know some of these are diamonds. They glow under infrared light. Others don't. Now, I don't know that they're not all diamonds, but some of them could be phonies. And I can't tell the difference just by looking. I would really have to get into it and study it. But there are a lot of things that we take for granted as this is right. And this is what we're supposed to do. And this is the Christian way of doing it. And we don't even think about it. Everybody knows the story of the young wife that was cutting the ends off the ham, right? Every time she went to cook a ham, she cut the ends off and, and put them aside. And one time she had a young child, and her child said, why do you do that? And she said, well, I don't know. I need to ask my mom. So she asked her mom. Grandma was there. And Grandma said, well, I don't know. My mom always did it. So they go to great-grandma, and great-grandma said, well, it wouldn't fit in the pan unless I cut the sides off. So even though they now had a big enough pan... They were still stuck in that same stupid habit that nobody understood. Nobody knew why they were doing it. It was just, that was what we did. So if we're going to change, if we're going to get out of misery and into peace and into the joy of the Holy Spirit, we're going to have to reevaluate everything that we do, everything that we think, and everything that we hold as normal or right um, where is it in the scriptures? It's in one of the Corinthians. It talks about taking captive every thought and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. It is so sad how we will, and Pastor Mike's talked about this many times, take what we like and consider that to be what God likes. With him, God does not like pineapple on pizza. With my mother-in-law, God loves pineapple on pizza. So we have to understand that our human minds, the physical is warped, which is why we have to daily reprogram. We are the only species on this planet that can reprogram itself. All animals act by instinct. You have to train them, stop them from doing what they were doing before and get them to do something different. We are the only ones that can make ourselves do that. 
So let's take that ability, that God-given difference between us and every other being on this earth, and use it to our advantage, justifying others. Now, or the nice things they do make up for it. Well, I know they're mean to, to us, but, you know, they gave us money when you were sick in the hospital, and we couldn't have paid for it. So therefore, it's okay for them to treat you badly. In my family, it was, oh, well, she prays for us. So this person could be an absolute jerk to you, mean, rip you to shreds. But because she prays for you, it's okay. You have to just tolerate it. Some of you are looking at me like, yes, okay, I get it. Moving on, deny the harm. Oh, just ignore it. Quit being a baby. Just forget it. There are some things we need to forget. There are some things that need to be covered under a multitude of love, love covering a multitude of sins, I mean. Does that make sense? Yes. There are some things that you do, but you have to make sure that you are throwing it aside and you're not hanging on to that. And deep down, you've got this seething anger at that person that you never know when it's going to come up. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Little slights are no big deal. What did Jesus say if someone slaps you on the cheek? Turn the other cheek. Now, he didn't say if someone stabs you with a knife in the gut, turn around so they can stab you in the back. A slap, no biggie. But something that is deeply harmful to you has to be dealt with. And excusing, just like blaming, will keep you from dealing with the issue and working through it. It hurts to work through an issue. Sometimes when you go to the doctor and they have to do something, it hurts worse when they fix it than it did before they fixed it. My, da <clears throat> My dad excuse me, has a story. He's playing football and you broke your finger in 14 places. And the doctor basically, what did he do? He grabbed your finger and started doing this with it to put it back into place. Now, did that hurt a little bit? Were you, were you doing everything you could not to kill the guy? Oh, didn't he give you tongue suppressors? He gave him a big stack of tongue suppressors to bite on while he was yanking his finger. But if he hadn't done it, his finger would have been crooked and possibly unusable. So the injury itself didn't hurt as much as the fix. And sometimes that's what it's like emotionally too. And so we stuff these things deep down inside of us and we pretend that they don't matter. And inside we're just, ugh, you've got this grinding going on and it hurts. And there are times when you have what's called floating anxiety. You ever just feel anxious and you have no idea why? And then you have to think about it. And I will have to say, Lord, tell me what's wrong so I can deal with it. And I have to go through things sometimes. Okay, was it this? No, it wasn't that. Okay, well, was it? No, no. And sometimes I'm going back two or three days and, oh, that's why I'm upset. Okay, Lord. And then we work through it. He helps me through it. I don't just forget it. And if it's not something that you need to say to a person, if it was just um, a slight uh, somebody snapped at you in the store or when you were trying to do something at work and they were rude. You know, you don't always have to, but man, if it's a pattern, if they do it twice, if they do it three times, that's a pattern and needs to be dealt with. And so often in our culture of, oh, we'll just let it go, we let people abuse us because we make excuses. And what's really bad is when we let people abuse other people. Whether it's our employees or children, our spouse. 
because we don't want to deal with it. Okay, this is how we excuse ourselves. They took it wrong. You know what? It doesn't matter if they took it wrong. You owe them an explanation if that's the case. Someone or something else made me do it. Well, I was just having a bad day. Well, my mom always abused me and said this about me, and they said something and sounded like her. And so I just... This is removing the blame. Justify. Well, they asked for it. I do so much for them, they should be grateful. Deny the harm. It wasn't that bad. If, in particular, my, my mom's mom, if she did something and I didn't like it and I told her, okay, Grandma, I don't like the fact that you did this. Well, that's all right. She would say that to herself and to me. In other words, it's okay if I mistreat you. That's all right. Or I was being childish. Or I just needed to forget about it. I really do my best to forget about it. But when other people talk to me about things that they've gone through, this is the one thing that I can identify with, is understanding what that constant verbal does and I got to hand it to her, she was sneaky. She didn't do it to me in front of my parents. She didn't do it to me in front of my aunt or my other cousins. She did it to me in front of my little sister who had no idea what was going on. And people will often do that. They'll be so sweet and so nice when other people are around. And they're so good at making you feel like oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe it is my fault. Maybe I am good for nothing. Maybe questioning. So you see the resentment and the harm that it can cause by being told don't deal with it. Excusing God. And some of you are, what do you mean excusing God? Okay, something goes wrong in your life. What do we say? I'm being punished. Anybody heard that I'm being punished? How about my husband, eight years old, riding a bike, crashed, dislocated his elbow, his arm, forearm came up, out, turned upside down and snapped back in. Was he eight? Oh, okay. I thought he was younger than that. Maybe, not, I don't know. I broke my arms when I was nine. I can't remember when he did it. But... They could not find a hospital that would take care of him until they got to a hospital where, let's see, you knew the administrator. He went to your church, and the administrator said, fine, fix it. So praise God, the surgeon was brave enough, took him in the operating room, knocked him out, yanked the arm back out, turned it the other way, and let it snap in. And that was my husband, a child, anywhere from 8 to 10, is lying in the hospital bed, his Sunday school teacher comes to visit him and says, now, Mikey, what is it that you think you did that God is having to punish you for? I'm glad he didn't tell me who that was until much, much, much later. And that really, really ticked me off. I'll tell you later, okay? It's weird preaching when your in-laws are here and you know, you've been part of their family for 37 years, and your dad is right there, and anyway. Being punished. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. If you're not condemned, can you be punished? If you're not convicted, can you be sentenced? If there's no condemnation, how can we be punished? God doesn't even follow his own laws. If he's punishing you, but says here that there's no condemnation because you belong to Christ Jesus, he's violating his own laws. 
If he violates his own laws, he is no, no longer God and we no longer exist. Are we all here? Then apparently God is not violating his laws, therefore he is not punishing you or me. Here's another one. He did this through Christ. This is talking about Jesus dying on the cross. When he freed us from the penalty for our sins. What's another word for penalty? Punishment. So if he freed us from the punishment, how can we say when bad things happen, God is punishing? It's not scriptural. I don't care who recites the Old Testament to you, whether it's in chapters and chapters and chapters. It doesn't matter. Remember the Old Covenant came along here, and there's the cross. And when it hit the cross, it fell and died. And a new covenant started from there. But we also have to remember that the vast majority of the Gospels are here. Right? All the things he told the Pharisees they had to do for eternal life, all of that stuff he said you had to do, that was under the law. He forgave us and now we go here. Wow. Wow. Amen. I'm being punished. Or here's a good one. God needed to teach me a lesson or God needed to get my attention. I will never forget when the very sweet young couple, three kids, loved the Lord, involved in their church, lived across the street from my parents, and lightning struck their house and burned part of their attic. And the young man told my mom, I guess God just needed to get my attention. Wow. Let's see what the Bible does say about how we get taught and corrected. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. All trials are inspired by God to teach us what is true and make us realize what's wrong. All disasters are inspired by God. What does it say? All scripture scripture. So if I am not reading the scripture, I'm not going to know what is useful and what is true and what is wrong in my life. And I'm going to go along and God is going to love me anyway, and I'm going to be forgiven anyway. I'm just going to be really stupid and I'm not going to grow. We don't tell people to read their Bibles because we're trying to pile rules. We want people to know what the word says realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, but it doesn't just correct us. It teaches us to do what is right. And that word correct doesn't mean punish. Have you ever used the wrong word in a sentence or you pronounced it wrong and someone told you what the right way was? That's all correction is. It's not a slap. It's not a sickness. It's not a car accident. It's not lightning striking your house. It's just, wait, whoa, 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 that was wrong. Do it like this instead. There it is, in yellow and purple. It's just God's plan for me. It's God's plan for me to give me a baby, but have it be stillborn, so that I will appreciate my other children. Or I got pregnant and I wasn't supposed to. I was supposed to have this child, so God killed that one so that I could turn around and have the right child. I have literally heard that. It breaks my heart. No, the enemy stole that child and God gave you another blessing. My little niece, Reagan, is a rainbow baby. My sister-in-law was pregnant and she had a miscarriage. And I was talking to her and my brother-in-law, Joel, on, we were texting, and I said, listen to me, you let her name that. That was a child. That was a life. That life is waiting for you guys in heaven. And because you made her, God gets to enjoy her. And so they did. They named her heaven. Drew put together the sweetest shadow box. It has her pregnancy tests and little shoes and... It's the sweetest thing. 
No, that wasn't God's plan for heaven to die. The enemy stole heaven, but God blessed with Reagan. Okay, I think I, I yeah, I'm not going to get all misty on that, but why? I've told you all this so that you may have peace. Anyone know who's talking here? Anybody know? Jesus, yes. That you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Here on earth. But take heart because I have overcome the world. He isn't saying, but take heart because I'm going to teach you lessons through it. No! It's my plan for you to suffer. I know of one person that God showed all of the suffering that he was going to have to go through for the sake of the gospel, and that was the Apostle Paul. And you know why he showed him all that? So that Paul would know what he was getting into. Paul had a choice. Was he going to go for all that? Or was he not? You cannot imagine the persecution that Lucy Rael has gone through because of the stigmata in her hands and on her body. There was a teenage girl that she was telling us about that had the same signs. And the girl knew everything that Lucy had gone through, and she prayed and said, Lord, don't give me this. I don't want this. And so a remarkable ministry did not take place because the girl didn't want to deal with it. The things that the enemy has thrown at Lucy, she was diagnosed with, well, we know when she was born, remember she told us her feet, her soles were fused together until she was over a year old, and that miraculously, they came apart. She was diagnosed with leukemia, healed from leukemia. She was diagnosed with cancer after cancer after cancer. They told her she had 90 days to live, but that was 30 years ago. On and on and on. And every time she got attacked by the enemy, what do the Christians say? God is punishing you because you're a false prophet. Well, this is just God's plan for you. Well, you must have some hidden sin. Wow, horrible. Here's another one. Whose purpose? The thief. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Anyone in here, you've lost a child? You've lost, Becky stepped out, but she's lost a child. You've had a miscarriage? Horrible. Horrible. Is that a rich and satisfying life? Then it didn't come from the enemy. I mean, it did come from the enemy. It came, did not come from God. If it does not, if it's not giving you a rich and satisfying life, it's not from God. But let's look at it the other way. First Peter tells us that when these fiery trials come, Pastor Mike's talking about it, you've got the armor of God on, you stand anyway. You stand anyway. Let's go on. Now how not to be miserable. All right. How not to be miserable. Don't excuse people. Don't excuse. And unfortunately, I forgot to put the definition for forgiving. But this is how we forgive, okay? We acknowledge the wrongdoing. Yes, what they said was wrong and should not have been said and was me. Name the wrongdoer. Yes, it was Megan. Yes, it was me. I did something wrong. Acknowledge the harm that it caused. Yes, it hurt my feelings. Oops, it hurt Mary's feelings. Acknowledge that it was wrong. Don't make excuses. Then work to forgive. Now, what does forgive mean? It means you don't want to punish the other person. It means you don't want, you're not wishing ill on that person. Next week, and I'll talk about this again, we're going to talk about when you are, another way to be miserable is to continually pursue a wrong or a finished relationship. 
you forgive, but you don't pursue a relationship if it's not health, healthy, if the other person doesn't want it. Oh my goodness, so many people waste years of their lives chasing after people who don't want to be in that relationship with them, and they're miserable. So we work to forgive, and how do we do that? We see the other side. Now, what do I mean by this, okay? We guess at the root, set a forgiveness date, bless those involved. Now, taking each one. If another believer sins against you, <clears throat> excuse me, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. What if somebody says something that hurts your feelings and you just let it go? And so for the rest of your life, you have that recording going through your head of what they meant, of what they said, and, and all, everything that you put into it, all of the motivation that you assign to the person for why they said that to you. And it's very possible the person didn't even mean it that way. It's very possible that you heard the wrong word. One time, there was a lady, and they, she and her husband went to church here, and the daughter said that they had been visiting other churches. And we were getting ready to do something, and she was on a list for volunteers. And I said to her, um, now, Amy said that you are, that you're like um, church shopping. Church shopping. And I understand if Bethel isn't the place for you, that's perfectly fine. We understand, you know, sometimes. And so I don't know if you want to get involved in this project because I know you're looking elsewhere. She was so offended because she thought I said church hopping. Church hopping is when you jump around to churches for whatever is the, the big hot thing going on. You know, people who follow a particular guest speaker around, a particular evangelist, and they'll give them the offering for the evangelist, but they don't do anything for their local church. They don't volunteer. They don't even go. You know, they just follow this person. And so she thought that's what I was accusing her of. And I had to tell her, I am so, so sorry. But if she'd just let it go, I'm sure she would have let it go well enough to tell all of her friends what I said and how rude I was to her. And that was not my intention at all. Next, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. Does it say you have to keep going back and getting insulted over and over and over and you have to keep blessing? No, but this is how we work to forgive. See the other side. Maybe I took it wrong. Maybe that's not what she said. See, this is what she did. Let's call her Agnes. Agnes gave me the benefit of the doubt and asked me, what did, wait, what did you mean? If it could be a misunderstanding, ask what they meant. If they meant to hurt and won't apologize, forgive on your own. And this will take us into pursuing a relationship that isn't right. Or maybe it was my fault after all. Maybe what I said, you know, instead of saying, oh, well, I didn't mean anything by that. What is your problem? You're being a baby. I'm sorry, I did not mean to hurt you. I promise I didn't. That is not what I meant. Or, you know what? I'm sorry I said that. Sometimes I say things and I just really wish I could take them back. And I can't... Ever had to do that? Ever had to eat your words? That hurts. Doesn't taste good. Guess at the root. Were they lashing out? Maybe they'd had a really rotten day and you were the, the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. I have a, a tendency to get into very stressful projects. 
And I have to say to the people around me, I'm not mad at you. I'm very disgusted with the circumstances. It's like Pastor Mike trying to make his photocopies. He wasn't mad at Kevin. He wasn't mad at TJ. He wasn't mad at anybody, but he was mad at that machine. But sometimes you'll say something to someone and they will lash out and it's like, okay. Maybe there's a deep offense that you don't even know they're carrying. Or maybe you have a deep offense against them and it causes you to spew. Maybe they're just mean-spirited or have a character flaw. Do you know we have to forgive all of it? But there are different ways of dealing with it. Lashing out, ask what's wrong, be kind. You know, they're mad at you, know, snap at you. Are you okay? I'm sorry, I, I really don't mean to be a bother. I, I really didn't mean to upset you. Is, is there something I can do to help you? Do you know how many people will come right down and begin to pour their heart out to you when you do that? Especially at a Christian organization. Because the love in them responds to the spirit in you. I mean, the spirit in them responds to you. One time, oh man, this was probably 25 years ago. I park out by the modular buildings and Sunday morning and I was walking in and a man that I knew well, member of our church, pillar of the community, very nice man, comes bursting out of one of the modular buildings. And so I said, oh, good morning, Frank. Good morning. And he looks at me, he goes, where's a broom? And I said, I don't know. He goes, can never find anything around here. I'm like, well, okay, you know, it's probably in the broom closet by the men's bathroom. So why don't we walk over there and get a broom? Well, just then the Sunday school teacher walked up with a broom. He had gone over and gotten one. Somebody had broken into the modular building. And Frank was furious that somebody would desecrate the church like that. And that anger, I just happened to walk into it. It had nothing to do with me. I found out what was wrong, and I, I didn't have to deal with him. I just thought, well, you know, if he's going to do that, I guess he's going to deserve the reputation. But, you know, there was really nothing else to do. He was just upset. If it can't be worked out, you know, sometimes if they lash out at you and you say, are you okay? Yes, I am. And you just blah, 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 blah. Turn around. Walk away. Forgive it on your own. You're not going to get an apology. Understand that that is either a wrong or a finished relationship or one that you're going to have to talk to the Lord about if he wants you to put the effort into it. Deep offense. Find out what's wrong. Okay, this isn't, you know, to say that um, I've got this issue with Mandy, and every time I see her, she's just mean. And so I need to get with her and say, Mandy, have I done something to offend you? And then that's her opportunity to tell me. Now, if it's me, I'm going to tell you that 999 times out of 1,000, I didn't mean it because I'm not trying to hurt people, but I do. You know the old open mouth, insert foot thing? We've all done that, have we not? My motivation is never to cause anybody any hurt, but sometimes I'll say the wrong thing. I just may use the wrong word, and I don't even think some words that I would consider just normal every day. Some people consider terrible, vile cuss words. I've had, I had to work once I started preaching not to say crap. To say all that crap, or they crapped out, or they're talking crap. And because he would point out every time I said crap when I was preaching. And to me, it was no big deal. Ask anybody my age if crap is a bad word, and they're going to tell you no. Especially my children's age. They have no idea why their grandparents get so upset when they use that word. One time, when I was, I don't know, in my 30s, 
I said something about my butt. Now, why is butt a bad word? I will never understand that. What do you get with a ham? You get either the shank, which is the leg, or the, the butt, which is the butt, the butt of the pig. So you can say butt in relationship to the derriere of a pig, but you can't use the word butt for the derriere of a person. The end of the cigarette is a butt. Anyway, let's go on. So maybe Mandy said, you use the word butt and crap way too much, and I'm deeply offended at you. I'll apologize. Tell me what word doesn't offend you. I have literally asked people. I had to ask a, a friend of mine, and he said he didn't mind the word crud. And I said, okay. So crud like that, and you can't say crudding out, so flaking out, and talking crud on people. Literally. Whatever. If the apology is not accepted, go on your way. Or analyze yourself and figure out what deep offense did that person do to you that you treat them so badly every time you see them. Hmm. If they're mean-spirited or have character flaws, if this is criminal, call the police. If somebody vandalizes and they're there, call the police. If somebody threatens you, call the police. If you're being abused, get out, run, and call the police. And I'm going to say this. There is nowhere in the Bible that says we're not allowed to press charges. Do what's necessary to protect you and others. And that especially means your kids. If it's not dangerous, point out the fault. So you, sometimes you can tell when a person said it on purpose to humiliate you in front of everybody else. You know, there's no reason why you can't say, you know, that was uncalled for. And a lot of times you'll get this answer, what? I didn't mean anything by that. Boy, your faces are just funny. You're all grinning whenever I bring up these examples. If it can't be worked out, you're going to have to turn around and walk away, go on and forgive it on your own because you'll never get an apology. But you can't let it go. Oh, well, that's just the way they are. It's okay. They bought me earrings once. You see the big difference there? If you have been mean-spirited and they point it out to you, don't get all defensive and try to excuse yourself. Apologize and then get help to change. I have a very dry, sarcastic, ironic sense of humor. And I have hurt people because they didn't realize that I was kidding. And I have had to say, I am so, so sorry. And I've had to make myself break myself of that habit. Now, my husband, we sit on the couch and we're sarcastic all night. We don't insult each other. We never, ever insult each other. But we can be as sarcastic and, and facetious with TV or whatever else we want. But I can't do that with everyone. And if that potentially harmful habit comes over into my public life, I've got to change. Set a forgiveness date. We talked about this last time. Remember, say aloud that you forgive so-and-so or yourself. Okay, today is February 2nd. Today, on 2-2-2022, I forgive myself. This day I forgive myself. 
I'm going to quit blaming myself. I'm not going to be mean to myself about this anymore. And I forgive myself for being human, being foolish, not having the mind of Christ or letting the mind of Christ work in me in that particular moment. I forgive myself for seeking the attention of people that I should not have been seeking the attention of, and therefore that prompted me to say something completely out of line. I have apologized to the person. I am praying spiritual amends for the person that I hurt. And today I forgive myself. And Lord, I thank you that you are helping me to change. Keep going back to that. When the enemy comes back and throws it at you again, okay, no, 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 no. On this date, I forgave Pam for stepping on my foot and not apologizing for it. And every time I see Pam and that feeling tries to come up in me, no, 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 I forgave Pam on this date and I pray for her well-being. And Lord, for the person that I stepped on their foot, I pray for their well-being. May your blessings be on them. May your peace overtake and surround them. Your goodness and mercy follow them wherever they go. Whatever is causing them to be hurt and causes them to lash out at other people, I pray for their own inner healing, that they will stop that behavior. Not for my sake, but for their sake. And then you don't have bad feelings after a while. This can take years. Find a safe Christian to talk and pray with you. Now, what did we say? Once, maybe twice. Any more than that, you need to go see a counselor. I do not need to keep burdening Sharon with everything that Pam did to me when she stepped on my foot. Right? We understand? Now, excusing God, remember, it's not God's fault ever. It is never God's fault. Why does he allow it? Because we are alive and we live on planet Earth and we are in a fallen state in our natural existence, but not in our spiritual existence. Nothing goes wrong in our spiritual existence. Nothing. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There's no punishment. There's no disaster. Not in the spirit realm. And remember that our time in the flesh is like one grain of sand compared to the entire Sahara Desert. So let's not blame God. Now we can tell him, God, my stupid human brain wants to blame you for this. And the Lord will say, that's okay, I can take it. I have literally heard him say that to me. And then I don't feel like blaming him anymore. To sum up, change the way you think. When you're hurt, deal with it. When you see someone hurt someone else, deal with it. Don't let that resentment sit in you and you never know when it's going to come flying out. And that's how we are not mis miserable. Right? Okay. Next week, again, I'll be talking about pursuing a relationship that is not good for you or is over. And we don't know it. Or we don't want to accept that. that <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys are so cute. You're doing this all night long. I'm like, I'm just going to keep talking because they're just affirming me, and I like that. Now, even if the person never apologizes... I told my parents after my grandma died, I can't, I used to be able to give you a long list of examples of things that she did to me, and I can't anymore because I chose not to think about them. When I was seven years old, she tried a hula hoop. That was the funniest thing I ever saw. Not only was she sh kind of short and dumpy, but one hip was higher than the other, and she's trying to do this hula hoop. And my cousin Robin and I were rolling on the floor, and she, tried, and she kept doing it. 
And the harder we laughed, the more she did it, and the harder we laughed. I'm going to think about that. I'm going to think about when she called our answering machine. She hated, hated answering machines. And we'd go through the whole thing. Hi, this is Mike and Rhonda's. Please leave us a message, and we'll call you right back. Beep. And we would hear, ah, crickets. <laughs> so you know what I did? I called her back because <laughs> I knew who it was. No, she didn't say crap. She said crickets. So that's what I choose to think about with her. And I choose to think about all the Bible stories. And I think about the flannel graph that she had in her bedroom. And I think about the songs that she taught me and the scriptures that she taught me. That's what I choose to think about with her. All right. He never made it in here. He must be making his copies. So if you're going to be giving this evening, Todd will be happy to give you an offering envelope if you'll raise your hand. Or you can give electronically according to the slide that Jack is putting up any second now. There it is. We have had now two bids on the roof. They're the same. The Lord's going to work it out. I don't know how, but he's going to work it out. But we're working on it. We're working on it. We're going to get there. The Lord is giving basically Jeff Moss the wisdom because I said, I'm praying for you to have the plan because I don't even want to deal with it. That, that, that can be your part of, of the church, figuring out what to do about the roof. But God is good. We're going to have a good night tomorrow night. We're going to have lots of new families. We're going to have the families that we already have all coming back and we'll get new families. And we'll get them in here and we'll teach their children the word of God and send them as little spies back into their homes to bring the blessing of God with them. Amen? Amen. All right. Pastor Margie, you have anything to say? No? Pastor Ron? Oh, no. No. Okay. All right. I think... We're having an ordination service on Sunday. Pastor Mike, I planned it for this Sunday, but he wasn't sure. So we'll either be having an ordination service this Sunday or next Sunday. And we are ordaining somebody who basically has his own congregation of about 500 students and all their families. We're ordaining Mike Pinky. And we're going to be giving a license and an official title of worship director. Guess who that's going to be? Becky. No, just kidding. <laughs> so this past week, we said goodbye to some people, and we're saying hello to others. All right, let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for everything we have and how you bless us abundantly over and over and over again. We give tonight because we love you and we want to see the kingdom of God to go forth in Jesus' name. Bless everyone and bless Bethel Christian Center School and Church. In Jesus' name, amen.